check, mic check one, check two.
How are you, Mike? Good. Ready? Good afternoon, everyone. It's um, my pleasure to welcome all of you to the, the open forum for faculty. This is, this is odd. A lot of things are different this year. Um, usually, the student open forum is the least well attended. Um, and this year, it was very, very well attended. Obviously, issues around uh, the travel restrictions and those sorts of things. Um, not a lot of state classified personnel. I think you all are vying with the state classified folks for the lowest attended forum, which is not, not typical. And I know you have fewer people in the front rows than any group has, which we'll, we'll see, how the, see how the questions go to see if that foreshadows anything. We'll <laughs> but you all know how this works and why we do it. We've done it every year since I've been president. It's just a chance to get together and, and hear what's on your mind, see what questions you have, um, concerns, criticisms. We joked yesterday, I said, uh, starting year number 10, I don't think we've ever had a compliment at an open forum, but we'd be open to them if that ever, ever seemed appropriate. In any case, I'll quit filling time and see what questions you have. We've got a microphone here, see what, uh, you know, if you'll raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you, and, and that way it'll be heard on the webcast, which I'm sure both the people watching will enjoy hearing. Bob. Well, I don't want to be out of character on this, Tony, and shock you. But uh, one thing I do appreciate is kind of the work of a lot of people on campus on behalf of non-tenured faculty. Yeah. And I see that progressing kind of by semester by semester. I think it's a hugely important thing to do. So I appreciate your help on it as well. Thanks. And I think, think that's a topic yeah. where you're right. We For years, we kind of we kind of ground away on this part of the curve, made, some, made a little progress, but n not what we should have. And now it seems like we've maybe turned a corner a bit and are making progress a lot faster. And you're right, that's a ton of people doing that work. So thanks. Was there a second half to that question? No, but, sorry. but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you go, all right, I'll give you a chance. How are you? I'm good, hi. Uh, my name's Moti Gore and I'm an assistant professor in philosophy. Um, so I've asked around a little bit on this question, I've gotten some answers, haven't dug into it anymore, so I thought I'd ask you. Uh, we, as you know, And this don't seems like a better place to get an answer? Uh, <laughs> I'm honored, but... <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Uh, I thought it couldn't hurt to stop by. Um, we don't participate in social security. Correct. Uh, when I looked into this when I was hired a year and a half ago, uh, it seemed that for some institutions, it's possible for them to opt into Social Security internally, should there be a sufficient number of people who are interested in doing so. Uh, I was told, though, that in, with other institutions, depending on how they were set up, you would need a change at the legislative level. Do you know whether it's open to us as an institution, as a faculty and staff group, to opt into that in some way, or would the change need to happen in Denver? Do you happen to know? I don't know, but I do, I do perceive that at least I can get an answer to that question and, and know where to go to get it, so I can find that out. Um, as far as I know, since I've been here in 93, I don't know when the state opted out, but it was before 93. Um, and I, mean, I don't know that that since 2000, in the last so 17 years that I've been on the cabinet, I don't think this topic's ever come up, but I can find that out for you easily. I've enough. just talked to people here and there, and I'm not the only one who... So, the states were allowed to opt out so long as they could show the federal government that they are providing something right. that's similar. Right. And for a long time, that was para. And for whatever reason, I wasn't here. I don't know the history. We're now in a defined contribution plan, which in certain respects, in my view, is inferior to a defined benefit plan like Social sure. Security. So I know that a defined contribution plan does qualify for, you know, states are allowed to leave, but they're still a little bit... It's, it's debatable yeah. whether a defined contribution plan should qualify as being equivalent to a defined benefit plan. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's something that I find to be a bit disconcerting given that everything is, ends up in stocks or bonds and we know what happened in 2008 and yeah. some people didn't retire and it, there's a lot of problems. Agreed. So, you know, it's interesting, I don't want to take us too far down the, the, the path on this question, but, you know, if you went back 
I guess, uh, kind of early and mid 80s, um, defined contribution plans started to become the rage because with the interest rates that were out there, the prevailing thinking at the time for those of us who were junior faculty members was, wow, you know, all these great 15, 17% returns and I'm only, I'm only guaranteed 8% return through my defined benefit plan. Um, that just seems like such a long time ago to talk about numbers like that. Yeah, we can find that out. Thank you. Hello, I, Antonio Pedros uh, from uh, Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. How are you? Could you, um, I have two questions, okay. address them in the order that you may uh, deem uh, better. So um, one of them is uh, regarding uh, bullying data. Do we have the bullying and the- Oh, bullying, gotcha, sorry. Uh, data, uh, yep. so I mean, uh, have we had any follow-up of that report that we had in the past and how does it look when we compare them. Um, I understand that obviously there are some attempts to to, ha to engage in that in that discussion, but I would like to know if we can hear about data. Uh, number two, also, I would like to know uh, if your office has uh, already calculated the impact that the travel ban may have in our uh, budgets, uh, our running budget, um, and also if. Um, you could elaborate on the amount of money that we are even in the future able to have to hit against that wall if um, funding for, for example, uh, arts, as has been suggested, uh, ends up being taken out from, from our support. Okay, um, there's a couple parts to that last one, so remind me if I miss any of them. I'll, I'll deal with them in the order you asked them. Um, I don't believe I've seen new data since December when I spoke to the faculty council on, on the bullying um, policies. And I'm also not aware that new cases have been brought, although it, it could have happened and just hasn't reached my desk yet. And I apologize. If I owed you some data back and forgot to do that, uh, you'll have to refresh my memory on it because I, what I knew in that, and what we discussed that day was there was a very limited number roughly distributed equally, um, male and female, no cases had been found to have uh, met the threshold where the policy was inducted. I think it was four cases, if I remember right. But if, um, what, what, what's useful in terms of more data? I'm, I'm more thinking specifically about, for example, in, in one of the, I remember that uh, people were asked to self-identify if they had either witnessed or hats or oh a survey type mechanism that kind of if if there had been any survey uh, to follow that up and if things seem to be going up stay in the same yeah, going I, down okay i think i'm with you now rick do you do you, is this ring any bells with you no no we did a survey uh, on uh, probing the uh, the existence of bullying incidents uh, we have focused our attention in this period of revising the bullying policy. That's an extensive uh, effort ongoing and is, I hope, approaching completion in the next couple months. So. But let, we, we can certainly, here's another question. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll. Campus Climate Survey, yes, that has been completed. I haven't, I haven't seen those data. We can certainly pull that out. I think comparing that over time, because what we're trying to do, candidly, to avoid survey fatigue, is to, to sort of put campus climate survey like every three years, a, gen, a more gender-based survey every three years, a more race-based survey every three years, and try and sort of cover the waterfront that way. But um, yeah, I'll circle back to Mary. Um, Nick, if you'll help me remember that, and we'll, we'll see what we do have and don't have. Um, and I think it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. Um, as with the last climate survey, we'll push those data out publicly and make sure they're available to everybody. Um, now, your next question was about have we modeled costs related to the, the travel ban? Yeah, we've talked about it. I, I don't know that I would, 
I don't know that I would say it rises to the level of what I would consider modeling because the assumptions are so, you know, we have to guess at it, right? Nobody knows um, what the specific, what will happen with the travel restrictions, what will stay and what won't stay, but probably the bigger impact on enrollment um, is going to be around attitudes, right, and, and fear of traveling to the United States and studying here. Um, European and Canadian universities have, have already um, taken very active efforts to, to step into that international student market. Um, so we've got a few things that can guide us, right? We, we can look at what happened to the melt rate or the return rate from fall semester to spring semester this year and compare what happened in previous years. It's an inexact comparison because the travel restrictions um, came pretty late in that process but it should give us some reflection of what general attitudes toward our November election we're doing. Um, I was at a higher ed uh, event last night in Denver and uh, one of my colleagues here in state was saying that their return rate um, dropped by, it's a fairly small institution, but their return rate of international students dropped by 40%. It was a 40% greater uh, drop in return rate than the previous year. Uh, they were pretty heavily STEM oriented, and, and so they had a. It was a big impact on them. I don't think we've we haven't seen that rate of drop. Our our rate of drop is not a, you know it's different, but in the same order of magnitude as what we typically see. Um, there are projections. You know, the international uh, student groups across the country are sort of trying to make projections about what they think will happen uh, next fall versus this fall. We can look at apps, but uh, the yield rate on apps for international students is, is a tricky predictor. We could go back and factor in what happened after September 11th, 2001, but that's an inexact correlation as well, right? I mean, we, it was a very different situation, and um, we saw dips, substantial dips, but they bounced back in about three years, and a lot of that were related um, to uh, student visas and AAAS and, and APLU and AAU and all those groups, ASCU got involved and lobbied pretty hard and uh, I, that was a part of, of the lifting there. Um, so what can we say about it? I think at this point we would say our best guess is that maybe revenue from international students might be down somewhere in the one and a half million dollar range for next year, but at this point in time, um, our domestic non-resident applications and deposits are high enough that we think we would see a substantial overall revenue increase still if those numbers hold the way we think they will so that we actually would see um, again rev enrollment related revenue increases next year even though we'd see a decrease within the international students. My confidence interval around all of those projections is pretty wide. Um, I mean, it's, the, it's, I think, the best we can do, but if you asked me to, you know, bet a lot of money on it, I'd, I wouldn't be very inclined to do that. Rick, are there things I left out that you think we ought to add to that? No, that, that's what we've been uh, discussing between one and 200 students shortfall in international, hopefully made up with domestic non-resident students, um, maybe less of an impact on the budget, therefore, but an impact on diversity. Absolutely. And campus culture and climate. Uh, you had another end to that question, at least one more that I'm... Uh, funding for the arts. Funding for the arts. Oh, funding for the arts, yeah. So on all the other funding pieces, I just think we're, we're flying in the dark at this point. You know, there's, there's been... I mean, we know a little bit more about some of the things that have happened around the arts. Um, and I think you know we've got our federal um, legislative relations folks monitoring all those things very closely. Um, we'll keep our, our best eye on it. I know a lot of the national organizations, um, APLU, and as I said, the ones the ones I mentioned before, are already gearing up talking points around these things. Um, in general, um, you know, universities tend to have very good relations with their federal delegations, right? And so I think it'll be an interesting it, it'll be an interesting question if if the big national organizations and all of us as individual state institutions 
um, wind up lobbying our delegations and saying, you know, this is doing real harm to the, um, not just the R&D engine of the university, but to, to uh, one of the world's finest higher education systems in all its facets. How much weight will that carry uh, versus if, if, there's, if there's a push from the executive branch to really reduce those sorts of funding levels? I'm reluctant to, to do too much more right now than watch it and, and plan for it because I don't, I don't honestly know what that would be. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions on it that we should be tr paying attention to? Thoughts, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, thoughts, plenty of them. Uh, I mean, if we were talking about uh, people who really were more interested in figures and in ideology, I would then probably be more on the safe side of the equation. Uh, but since I think that there is a clear ideological point in, in having some some, question, some things being questioned on this funding, um, honestly, I'm, I'm more on the uh, pessimistic side of the equation. And, and I think that eventually we should have to, to start brainstorming about that. I'm not saying that you are not doing no. it. Um, I'm just saying Understood. that I would certainly um, not wait for the best because I yeah. am not sure that may happen. Yeah. Fair comment, thanks. Paul Doherty of Fish, Wildlife, Conservation, Biology. Tony, I'd, uh, sitting on the Board of Governors, two things that kind of uh, raise my eyebrows when I hear them is, gosh, we've gotten so far behind on deferred maintenance and some of the utility construction, and, um, and then the other piece is how we've gotten behind on uh, salaries, I guess the most recent one, for full faculty, anyhow, it's maybe 89% of our peers. And I'm kind of curious about what you see uh, for strategies going forward to address those two needs and, yeah. and give me some hope at least around the salaries or sure. something like that. Um, so I, you know, first of all, I would say that I, I don't think we are, I think we're actually better off than probably, I saw a number on this, but I'm gonna, I'll reserve the right to be wrong on this number, but I, I'm pretty sure we're in the upper half of research universities in terms of how well we've kept up with deferred maintenance. Now, is it a big number? Yeah, but keep in mind how that number's calculated. For those of you who, I think you all know this, but Paul is the faculty rep to the, to the Board of Governors. And, and so at the last meeting, um, at our February meeting, we sort of have, a, the board has a mini retreat and we go over a, a wide variety of data, um, uh, various metrics and parameters, everything from enrollment, student success, you know, salaries, deferred maintenance, physical plant, a lot of, it's the full, full waterfront of things. And in that, we talked about a level of deferred maintenance, but that, that number that's calculated, how far behind are we on deferred maintenance, basically says, if you wanted to take all of the buildings on the campus at, at one point in time up to some, do you remember the percent level? There's a percent calculation that facilities use that say it's like 95% of, of, of brand new. Grades from there, 60 or 70, 60s they're almost condemned actually. You have to get really bad to go below 60. Many of our buildings are uh, perfectly functional in the 80s, but they're starting to show a little wear and tear. So, I mean, when we look at those numbers, uh, for one thing, virtually every university in the country has these huge hundreds of millions of dollars deferred maintenance list, which essentially says, if you, but by the way, that's calculated. If you wanted all of the university campuses across the country to be 95% of new, this is how much it would cost you. Is that a useful stat? I don't, it, it doesn't do a whole lot for me, but it's an apples to apples comparison, at least across places. And in, and in that respect, we've done better. Now, I do worry, and you've heard me worry in front of the board. Um, I don't see that the state's gonna be in a position um, to step back into the deferred maintenance game. And if you looked at our percent, um, our condition index as a percent of new now versus 20 years ago, we've probably lost some ground because the state used to fund a lot of deferred maintenance issues. The deferred maintenance reserve fund was raided during one of the recessions and emptied out. And so that, that's been small um, since then. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we're gonna face in the, in the not too distant future is trying to decide 
are we going to continue to sort of piecemeal together deferred maintenance, you know, eight, 10 million from facilities. We've got these $2 million enrollment reserves that if we meet our enrollment goals and don't need the reserves, um, then we chip those over into deferred maintenance. We set those up my first year as president. Are we gonna kind of continue to, to sort of piecemeal our way through that? Or in certain areas, particularly sewers, chilled cooling loops, boilers, um, roads, um, as we use more mass transit on our roads, our roads are gonna stand up less um, that, for a longer period of time, a less long period of time than they used to. Um, are we gonna bite the bullet and start to invest in the campus's infrastructure? There's pros and cons around that, right? And, and we're not naive about it. The, the minute we take on the responsibility for our infrastructure, um, given the challenges that exist in front of legislators, it's gonna be very hard for them not to say, well, shoot, if the university can handle that, that's great, thank you, uh, and we'll look to other things. On the other hand, hoping that the state steps back into the deferred maintenance game, I think is problematic. Um, this campus is entrusted to us and watching it kind of fall apart if, if we were to do nothing on our watch doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I think our, and then there's a, there's a very judgmental debate. Are we better off arguing to the state for salaries, for example, or are we better off arguing to the state for deferred maintenance? And different people see those different ways. Um, I tend to think a lot of the salary issues um, are probably going to be more potent arguments for us um, going forward. So uh, that's what I would say around the, around the deferred maintenance side. On the salary side, and we also discuss salaries as a percent of peers, on a pure salary basis, and Rick was right to point this out at the last board meeting, I don't know that we've lost a lot of ground, right? We're kind of where we always were, which is assistant professors are pretty much at the market level. We compare to percent of peer institutions. And, that, and you'd figure that has to be the case, right? Because if we're going to attract good faculty, we pay the market rate or people don't come. We lose some ground in associate professors. We get down into kind of the, uh, what, 95, 96% range. And by the time we get into the full professors, we're sort of down in the 92% range, which again, I don't think surprises any of us who have been around here, uh, whether we like it or not, the salary pools that we've been able to provide given the state of Colorado's level of support haven't kept up with national averages. And so over time, you'd expect that, that we would lose ground unless, unless we can change something around that. Um, what's gotten worse for us is the salaries and benefits, the total compensation piece, where we've started to drop farther behind. And we've, put, uh, we've been working to putting money into our compensation package over the last three years to try and shore that up. But apparently, um, that not only fell short of shoring it up, we've continued to lose more ground. So this is an area we're doing some analysis in. What you know, We need to go back and, and dig further into the data now and say, where exactly within that compensation package are we falling short? Is it in the defined uh, contribution retirement plans? Uh, is it something around the healthcare benefit systems? And how does that tie in with a lot of the changes that occurred? Uh, through the Affordable Care Act, and, and even if we could figure that out at this point, which I'm skeptical. I mean, we brought in consultants as the Affordable Care Act came into being, and they concluded for us that either uh, our costs were going to go up, stay the same, or go down. That was helpful. Um, even if we could figure out now whether the Affordable Care Act caused us to lose ground in benefits relative to the rest of the country, I think we all assume there's some sort of change coming in the Affordable Care Act and, and the, the Republican version of it. So I don't know how useful it is for us to spend a lot of our you know, competing time digging into that. But I do think it's fair to say that even if you thought our salary model was fine, which most of us don't, but it, it, you know, it's a salary model that we've been able to make work, we've been losing ground on the benefit side of that equation. We need to figure that out and we need to make, make more investments around that. Uh, let me stop there and see if I missed parts of the question or other things. Okay. Hi, I can kind of jump to another area of salary, yeah. I guess. Um, so I'm Hannah Caballero. I teach in the English department, um, and I'll open with a 
a piece of appreciation as well. Um, I mostly teach the ESL students here for composition. I've worked it into. I teach the bridge students. Um, so I will say I appreciate the very quick response the university had to show that their support at the administrative level all the way down to the teachers who are seeing these students every day. So I'll say okay. thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so my, my concern also has to do with salary compression. Um, I just filled out the survey that faculty council sent out. So this mm -hmm. is obviously a very um, exigent issue for all of us. Um, and so I'd kind of like to share some experience and concern and lead to a question with that, I guess. Um, so I know that for NTTF, the issue of compression has, been an, has affected the workplace environment and then as, you know, as well as our professionalization. Um, so I know that you know, when we come in and are, have been here for years and have done research and have experience, um, if we now make the same as our new peers who are just being hired on, um, it affects morale right. pretty obviously. Um, so I personally have trained our GTAs for four years, um, have done a lot of classroom-based research, done all this, um, have presented at conferences, and the people that I trained came in this year making the same as I did. Um, so there's that kind of morale piece where when we talk about it, you know, we're, we're start to question why we are killing ourselves at our jobs, um, and we kind of come to well, pride and psychic income essentially. Yeah. Um, and then I think that affects. And then, um, you, then you lay down in bed at night and go, run that by me again. Why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, so there's that piece of it, and then I think that to a more measurable area, um, our professionalization is affected um, yeah. to where a lot of us start to question, do I spend my quote unquote free time doing research and doing professional development or do I start doing freelance work to have a livable wage? Um, and a lot of right. us have come to, well, we teach full time and then we have freelance jobs on top of that. Yep. Um, so for me, professional development is personally and professionally gratifying. Um, but when it comes to paying a mortgage and student loans and car payment, like a lot of us do, um, we have to start balancing our time. And I would love to just teach, um, as a lot of my peers right. would. And you know, we, we want our students to ha um, have teachers who are up to date on our research and our knowledge of subject matter. Sure. So um, I guess my, my question is, is you know, what's being talked about for the NTTF level as at the reception for NTTF, and I know you talked about the content proposal being a step in the right direction. Um, they're still working on it. Um, but I guess I'm curious because a lot of what I hear is that the, the way that we're compensated for salary is very hard to even trace. So it's hard to know, you know, where do we need to be finding the money um, and, and what kinds of things are being talked about yeah. um, so that, you know, rank and promotion can start coming into play to, to salary. Right. So first off, for anybody who's missing the acronym, NTTF is non-tenure track faculty. Um, secondly, if there's something in there that you said that I disagree with, it's not coming to me right off the bat. So I, you know, I, I, I hear you loudly and clearly. Um, and I think our goal around non-tenure track faculty going back to when I was in the provost's office and, and to Bob's original question when our progress was on a geological time scale and we weren't, ma we weren't making much, um, our goal was to address exactly these issues, right? It was um, that faculty, particularly faculty teaching in the 100 and 200 level courses, uh, we had a lot of non-tenure track faculty in those courses. We spend so much money attracting students and wooing them here. And as an enrollment dependent institution, you know, one of the most cost effective things we can do are keep those students here. And if we've gone to all that effort and then their first experience isn't an optimal one, not because of the faculty member's fault, but because the faculty member is working a ridiculous number of courses and trying to do other things out here, that's just, a, it's a dumb business model, right? And, and we had been trying to make progress on it. So now I think we have some. We have, we've raised the floors and we've connected the floors to the, to the raise pools. And you know, we could sit here and list a set of things that we're proud of, but I don't know that that's really useful because the conclusion we'd arrive at at, at the end, if we're intellectually uh, honest with ourselves, is that that's great, but there's still a ton more to do. So I'd like to focus a little more on, on where we'd like to go and how we might get there. Similar comment, while we can, we can sit here and say, I think with, with honesty, 
um, that we're one of the leaders in the country in terms of how we're thinking about non-tenure track faculty members, that ought to be pretty embarrassing to us, right? Because it's like being the best surfer in South Dakota. I don't know that that's you know, something that we really should take a lot of pride in. Now I just defended everybody from South Dakota. Um, just the surfers? No, probably not. Probably all South Dakotans. Um, so, I mean, if you, could, if you could say, what's the goal? What do we want to get to? I, I mean, I'll reserve the right to, to be wrong on this and to take input from other people, but I would like to see us get to a point where non-tenure track faculty, after we hit a certain point, you've, you've essentially been in a full-time working relationship with the university for a certain number of years, and your performance has been such that we say, fantastic. You're, we want to be in a full-time employment relationship with you. We want you to feel proud of what you're doing. We want you to be you know, linked into to this institution and feel you're really a part of it. I think there's something in there about, and I don't know if this is the right number, but my mind goes to something like a, a salary that's 80% of the starting salary of tenure track faculty. If you're going to ask where I come up with that number, it's it's just a guess. I have no data to back it up whatsoever. I do find the longer I'm in administration, the more comfortable I am without data. Uh, and that bothers me. I, it's probably time. I, oh, oh, oh. I teach rhetoric. Ouch. That's really nice, and I should have seen that coming. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't have stung less, but I could have been prepared for it at least. Um, now this is going to take us down a rabbit hole of alternate facts, and I, let's just, uh, yeah, okay. So trying to get back on track. Some number that is formulaically related within the discipline to where we're starting tenure track faculty members, and then a ladder that moves people along and has some connection relative, and, and part of that I think we already have, relative to the raise pool that the other people are considered for. So how do we get the money to do that, right? Because right now, as we fix the entering people, we do exactly what you're talking about. We get compression and sometimes even inversions within our salary structure. And we see, you know, we see the same thing in the tenure track lines. There's no difference there, really. Um, maybe we have a little more room before it becomes acute, but it's acute in a lot of places. So the way I would characterize the university budget overall is that Keep in mind, for context, that we're in a state that has essentially the lowest state support per student of any state in the country. And we're a moderate tuition state. We're right about national averages. So if you look at this from the taxpayer or the legislator's perspective, you say, wow, you know, we've got these great universities that are turning out highly capable students and doing great research and scholarship at a fraction of the price that other states are paying, and we're still at the average of what our citizens have to pay. Well done, we'll see you next year, right? I mean, that's, and you can understand legislate, legislators' opinions around that. So given that, okay, footnote, we continue to work to try and change that narrative and, and do a set of things around that. But let's set that aside. Let's say that that's where we're at, then where does that leave us? Right now we've been in a period where through enrollment growth and a change in the mix of our residents to non-residents, not excluding any qualified residents, but being able to focus our growth on the, on the non-resident side, that's where the growth in our budgets have been. And I don't think we've made any uh, secrets of the fact since you know, 2008 when I became president, we've said, this is runway. You know, it's not a long-term sustainable model. Is that model, you know, if you did the extrapolations back from 07, 08, and 09, and you look forward, you said, wow, sometime in the 2020s, this runway runs out for us. If you do the extrapolations now, given the Hickenlooper administration's reinvestments and the way the budgets have gone, I think it turns out in somewhere in the, the late 2030s. Um, but still, at some point, the model is unsustainable, and, and you've seen the graphs across the whole country. Every public university is in this boat. Um, the longest ones get out into later in the century, but even those, you know, some of those are in states 
um, my home state of Illinois, where the state is essentially bankrupt but just hasn't been willing to use the word yet, um, at some point they're going to have huge problems in, in a really well-funded higher education system. So what we can, what, what, where that leaves us generally is that within a budget cycle, we can pick a thing, maybe two depending on the year, and make some real progress. You know, a couple of years ago, we did some substantial faculty cluster hires. Um, Rick was able to put in the academic revenue sharing, which I, you know, I think has been a really positive thing. Um, but, you know, those come at the expense of making progress in other places, right? So, um, are we investing enough in the compliance side of our research operation? Well, inventing, investing in, in What's seen as administrative bureaucracy is always wickedly popular at a university. And yet, if all of a sudden we have a major audit and a compliance failure, and it puts $350 million of research funding at risk that pays salaries and graduate students and all those sorts of things, then whoever replaces me will tell you why that was a really bad decision you know, around what we did. Um, so the question for us right now is more around prioritization. What are the things that we collectively as a community are going to say we need to make the most progress on? We can make progress on salaries if we, if we really are disciplined about what we do in other things. Maybe we can make progress on this benefit side if we're really disciplined around the other pieces. But we're just not in a position right now on a financial basis to say we're going to pick out five things or ten things and make substantial progress on them. And that, that creates... Uh, you know, uh, some pressure and some in, in the dynamics around the budgets because different people, not just in this room, but across the campus, will come up with different priorities for, for how things are sent. And it's easy in that process um, to sort of find scapegoats, right? To say, well, here's this thing, you know, that should go away. But I, I don't, you know, in terms of, and well, all right, I'll just say it out loud. I'll be the one to bring it up and Tom will throw something at me for being stupid about it. But the one that always comes up is the athletics budget, right? I mean, there's no secret about that. What, why don't we get rid of athletics and what would that do? So let's talk about that for a second. This fiscal year, the, athletic, the athletics budget is $36 million. Um, 11 of that comes from the university. There's a $3 million one-time um, backfill that we'll put into their budget. So that's 14 from the university. There's six million, if memory serves, from student fees, and there's 16 from the rest, self-generated revenue. So of that 11 million, nine million of it gets paid back to us in tuition. So if we wiped out athletics, if we just said, fine, we're done, we're eliminating intercollegiate athletics, um, we would get back 11 million, and we'd lose nine million in revenue that comes in from the tuition, so we'd get a net of two. We'd get the three million one-time backfill. So we'd get five million back. Our students would get six million back in their fees, but that's not available to us to reallocate. So we'd have about five million back of eliminating a thirty-six million dollar enterprise. That five million would save us a two percent tuition increase. So if we do five percent next year, we could make it three instead, or it would give us around 1% additional salary increase for everybody. So if we did that, if we eliminated those programs, we would lose everything that comes with it, including what's the third largest, other than the GI Bill and the Pell Grant, the third largest producer of diverse college degrees in the history of the American higher education system, and we would get a one-year 1% salary increase. So for those reasons, I, you know, that's, I use it as an example, right? I don't think we have really obvious places to take a vertical cut that benefits the whole institution for a long period. And when we have discussions about this, like in cabinet or council of deans, and we say, all right, come up with vertical cuts to the university. What are we going to stop doing? The answer is always, uh, your program is the, is the one that ought to get the vertical cut. Mine is pretty much mission critical to what we do. Um, so uh, all of that is a, is a very long-winded way of saying 
we should be open to everybody taking a look, and I hope our budget process is open like that. We put out the budget balancer where you can play with the same dials that we can. If somebody comes up with a breakthrough or an epiphany, I, I, want, <laughs> I want to know about it because we're all striving for the same goals. Short of that, and short of a major change in the funding model, what we're left with are difficult decisions about what are the highest priorities, how much progress can we afford to make on one or two things before we start to cut into others. I know that's not a very satisfactory answer. But. Is salary moving into one of those top two? Oh yeah, absolutely. Campus? In I fact, I'm last, sorry. Like... I would have said that what we heard last year as we went around um, the chair of the faculty council, Mary and, and Rick and I um, go around and meet with usually faculty council reps by department every year. And that seemed to be, we tried different things, but that has seemed to be pretty effective. So, and this is reminding me, we haven't scheduled that yet, have we? Nick? <laughs> um, the thing we heard loudly and clearly was salaries, salaries, salaries. Thank you. Let's do, there's someone over here and then Bob too. Um, Oliver Pearson from Our Chemistry. Um, Kind of touching on the same thing on the yeah. tenure track side. So the university made a decision to do 10% raises on promotion and tenure across the board, which to me is a recipe for inversions and equity exercise. It just furthers the compression because there's no compensation for that on the upper end. You know, I'm, we're in the middle of one of those down in my department. And okay. I'm wondering what the logic was. You're thinking about bad business plans. What's the logic of extending what's already compression at the young end up? Give that, man, <laughs> give that man a microphone. Back. <laughs> well, we, we, we expect to work with every department who only has, each department only has a few associate professors who were promoted recently to look at those inversions, right? No, we'll have to, we'll have to uh, inject some more resources, right. of course. But we didn't have the resources to fix all, everybody all at once last year. So we're we're reviewing those inversions now, department by department, looking for looking at proposals. Not every department was affected. Not every department had a recent uh, promotion, for example. And uh, we're looking at it more on a case-by-case -case basis. But part of the reason, if I'm, if I'm following your question right, part of the reason, going back to the earlier question of losing ground as we went into the associate and the full professors, part of the reasons to make these promotional increases greater was to uh, not have us drop as far behind as people went on through. But it creates the inversion. And we're back to the prioritization. Yeah, I hear you. I do. So I, th you know, we're going to be working to correct those inversions over the next couple of years. But I was very determined to fix this once and for all and get that done once, get that get that uh, initiative behind us, and then we and go. And I, I felt that was more important than doing something lower, and f uh, uh, for that promotion and and well, fixing constantly everybody. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I agree that it created some inversions and we'll have to deal with them. Yeah. Bob had one over here. Tony, did you say athletics? I did. And, <laughs> okay. and let the record show I'm the first well, one I'm, to bring I'm not, it up. I'm not so. going to take the bait on that one directly. <laughs> and I disagree with, with the numbers, but I don't want to you know, go and retread that argument again. But I do have an athletics issue that I think okay. is vital. Uh, and it's this, We've, this whole discussion has been about basically a lack of resources, <clears throat> low salary increases, uh, low salaries for contingent faculty and so forth, um, deferred maintenance, they're all money issues. And the issue I want to raise is this one. There's been on and off talk about uh, CSU joining, if someone opens the door, a Power Five conference. And my comment on that is that the case is a one, the case that's made is a one-sided case. And that is everyone's eyes get real large when they see $30 million per year in TV contracts to let's say the Big Ten and whatever. The problem is there are associated expenses that are much higher than that. And so as we plan for the future, I'm not talking about current athletics, sure. 
I would say forget about that totally. And the reason is, let's say the Big 12, I'll make it very quick here with some, some numbers. I think the uh, smallest budget is Iowa State around 70 million. Ours is around 38 million. Uh, Texas is a little higher than that, 150 million. And then you look at bit. athletic facilities and you look at number <clears> of teams, <throat> you know, and, and you know there's all kinds of research on it, you get into a competitive arms race. So right off the bat, if we got in it and we're gloating over the $30 million, whoops, athletics should be arguing for an increase in their budget of $40 million to keep up with the bottom member in the Big 12. I think it's a money-losing proposition. I think academics are the main priority. This is the future, and I would say forget about that uh, right now. Don't even think about uh, joining a Power Five conference. That's my comment. Okay. I, I think I've heard that from you before, right? <laughs> so my response to that would be, and, and Bob knows my response because he and I have had this conversation before, so I'll, I'll direct the, the response to the rest of you. Um, and, it, and it's difficult because we don't agree on the basic numbers to begin with, so it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge um, for us to go from there. But what I would say is that I'm, I'm very comfortable with a model that says, if you take, for example, the Iowa State budget at 70 some million, a lot of those expenditures um, built up in a lot of those big athletic department budgets are on new facilities. Our facilities are covered through a different model. So we don't, the, the self-supporting model around the stadium, which you can say, it's not gonna work, that's a screwed up model, fine. But at least the model on paper, you'd have to pull out of those budgets the, the facility pieces out of the other budgets. Then you'd have to pull out um, what I consider to be some very high budgets in the administrative arm of athletics. What it takes to get your sports to roughly the same spending levels, almost peer levels within a Power Five, are well within the revenues that come in while backing out every bit of university support. So the models that I've run would indicate that by joining a conference like that, we could eliminate university support and subsidy of athletics and still be competitive on the numbers. But it's not a conversation that Bob and I are likely to solve because we don't agree with each other's numbers to begin with. We also remember that half the power of five schools lose money more than half. Yeah. I, I have never made the argument that we were going to make money off athletics. What I have made the argument on is I think there is an argument to be made on return on that investment, a complicated argument, and I do believe that if we were to be successful at getting into a Power Five, we could look to a point in the not too distant future, phasing out our academic subsidies to our university subsidies to athletics, and put those money monies back into academics. I suspect that's were that to happen. I suspect that's something you and I would agree on, as being a good thing. If it were to happen, if it were to happen. <laughs> you don't have to grant the premise. <laughs> Uh, Antonio Pedro's uh, le uh, languages, literature, and cultures. Uh, I mean, I would like on the one side to praise the effort by the uh, by the provost. I mean, I though I'm one of the people who is probably. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Wait a second. We don't want to start the trend of saying nice things about yeah, the provost. Yeah, it's, it's, it's is... very unlike me. In <laughs> but uh, I would like to praise the, the effort for that raising the for assistant to associate. Though I'm really one of the people who eventually probably is going to be under the inversion. I hope that one day. A lucky will come my way. Uh, but um, I would also, when it comes to the salary discussion, um, one of the things that I get a little like upset, or, or not upset, it's just that it's figures, and of course they can be read in many ways, is that uh, the College of Liberal Arts is always on the side of never being on the 90s. We are pretty much on the 80s. So I'm very happy for the people in other colleges who are in the 90s, and probably for people who are in the hundreds. I mean, hooray for them. But the problem is that some of our units or some of our colleges are way below that. So I would like to have a more proactive uh, engagement with that situation because I'm very happy if people in some departments and in some units of this university and in the 100 levels, uh, I wish they were in 150. But the reality is that not everybody's in that situation. So when we are being told, oh, we are pretty much in the 90s or in early 90s, mid 90s, that doesn't feel like that for many of us. And the College of Liberal Arts, for example, is one of them. We are one of the most teaching, uh, credit teaching units in the whole 
university. We are, however, one of the units with a worst paycheck when it comes to that. So I think that that's something that eventually needs to be taken, uh, addressed in a, in a little more proactive way. I'm not saying that there is no intention or, or similar, but I think that some stronger steps forward needs to be, to be taken. And Thanks. number two, uh, I would also, um, because I proposed that in the faculty council, I would like to know if it could be possible for entities, specifically for entities, to create some system like the PDPs, Professional Development Program, that that way all of the entities of the university would be, for example, under the provost, under whoever it is, and that way take out the burden of professional development from departments, because at least in some departments like ours, our budget for professional development is extremely low. I'm talking about languages, literatures, and right. cultures, in which we have a ton of instructors, we have a very limited amount. So creating some sort of professional development program, specifically for entities that would take that burden, though we would still chip in and collaborate, but would really not depend on faculties, really being able to make magic numbers, uh, that would really be nice. So here's, here's my response to that last part again, and I sound like a broken record, I apologize, but um, we, can, we can put numbers to that. Here's, here's what that's gonna cost. And we can put it um, in a line in the budget prioritization, and here's the things we'd like to do, and here's the amount of money we have. And, the, and I would just encourage all of you, uh, as, as I do at every one of these firms, get involved in that budget debate, because um, there's not, uh, from the administration's perspective, at least from my perspective, I'll say, we're at a point now where we've addressed, uh, you know, when I, when I came into this job in 2008, there were a lot of things that, that I had priorities over to address. Um, we're at a point now where I would really, you know, we've got priorities around salaries, we've got priorities around benefits, there are important new programs, the one you mentioned. The question to me at this point is, what, what gives the most benefit to the most people, right? And so helping to, helping to get involved and prioritize what goes forward, because it's all gonna come out of the same pot of money, is I think just critical. I don't disagree with that as a priority at all. I think I'm getting to one more question signal. Oh. Okay, uh, no compliments, but we do have a budget question. Is it possible to award in-state tuition for graduate students coming from out of state if the advisor can provide at least a 0.25 FTE assistantship? Yeah, so again, let's give Rick a mic because where we're at on this is historically what we did as a university is uh, for one year, we, we as a university paid the gap between resident and non-resident tuition um, at the end of that year, then that student, if they were a domestic student, could qualify to become a Colorado resident and so they would get resident tuition for the rest of the way through their graduate program. The gap we had compared to other universities was around international graduate students who could never qualify to become Colorado residents. Um, for years, we struggled to crack the code on that. Um, the previous provost failed absolutely miserably at that. Um, and the current provost, I think, has solved it? I think so, but probably, probably the question refers to the part-time nature of the graduate student's appointment. You mentioned a .25 instead of a .5 appointment. So I think the current construct does give in-state tuition for GTAs and GRAs, independent of their, uh, their uh, uh, in-state status. Uh, but I think it's prorated uh, by the, th that, that uh, deal, so to speak, is for the half time, the 0.5, which is, which is the normal GTA, GRA assignment, and, and it's prorated if it goes down from that. So I think that's the way it works. I wish Jody was here to confirm that, but we can check on that. Uh, get back to me, Nick, or send me a quick email, and we'll uh, uh, remember how, how the... Uh, arrangement actually works, the algorithm works. Thanks. So um, I need to get on the road down to Denver, but let me thank all of you for taking time out of busy schedules and coming and being involved in the governance of the university and for the good questions, I appreciate it. Thank you all.